Alright, welcome to Blue Honey Radio. I am Andrew, and this is episode number two of The Lost Interviews. As always, you can visit bluehoney.org for this episode's corresponding webpage. There you will find detailed information, images, web links, and all sorts of good stuff. One of the best ways you can support this podcast is to make a pledge on patreon.com. You can pledge any amount you'd like per episode, even a dollar. You can easily find a link to my Patreon profile on bluehoney.org. Just follow the link to Blue Honey Radio and it'll be right there. Or you can go to patreon.com backslash bluehoney. And if you're listening to this podcast on YouTube or somewhere with links in the description, you'll probably see a link there as well. You can also support this podcast by visiting bluehoney.org and ordering a t-shirt. Okay, let's get into this. Timothy Freak is a philosopher, author, and public speaker. He calls himself a stand-up philosopher. Tim lives just a few miles away from Stonehenge, and while I was in the UK, I stopped in for an interview. At the far end of his backyard, Tim has built a fully renovated office, where we sat and had some tea and waited for his co-author, Peter Gandy, to arrive. Peter holds a master's degree in classical civilization, and he's an expert in classical mythology. Together, these two approach Christianity as pure myth, and they attempt to uncover a deeper Gnostic meaning. And while Peter stopping by was a pleasant surprise, I wasn't prepared to interview two people, so I ended up placing a microphone in the center of the room and just hoping for the best. I should probably apologize in advance for all of the room noise. I wanted Peter to start things off by talking about the importance of understanding actual history when dealing with mythology. Is there any history in the Jesus story? I would say there are uh, historical characters in the Jesus story. For example, Pontius Pilate is an historical character. Uh, Herod is an historical character. But what the creators of the Jesus story have done is use historical characters to weave into their fictional narrative about a God-man who comes to Jerusalem. And it would be like saying, well, uh, Ben-Hur has uh, various emperors and various people who really historically existed, but Ben-Hur himself is a fictional character. So I think although there are historical elements in it, the vast majority is myth. And as we've said in Jesus Mysteries, is myth derived from paganism. And you've only got to, if you take the Jesus story, you know, and it's a hard thing to imagine, but if you imagine you'd never ever heard the story, and uh, here was two scholars of the ancient world saying, look, we've come across this ancient manuscript, and it's a story about this guy, and he's born of a virgin, and he walks on water, and he comes back from the dead, and he... I don't think many people would go, wow, that must be true. I think what they'd go is, that's a really interesting myth, I wonder what it means. And it's fascinating that it's so obviously a myth, and yet our cultural prejudice makes us look at very similar myths in the ancient world about Osiris, Dionysus, Mithras, uh, all these other figures, and go, it's a myth. We don't go looking for the real Osiris. And yet with this myth, because it's so embedded in our culture, we are desperate to find a real Jesus. Except we can't, because there isn't one. But if there isn't one, then what is all the hype about? I mean, for me, the hype is all about discovering the Christ consciousness within you, this cosmic Christ within. Because it's within each one of us. But the techniques for discovering this Christ within have almost been lost. It's as if the truth has become a myth, and then that myth has become truth. Peter Gandy explains, Well, Paul, I mean, is a fascinating character and in our reading is the one of the earliest Christians. Now, what's been cleverly done is that even traditional 
Christian scholars would accept that the Gospels were written, you know, the conservative guess is, is say, 90 AD for the first Gospel. Now, that would place the Gospels 40 years after Paul's letters. But in the New Testament, it's put the other way around. So you get the Gospel stories first and then Paul's letters. When you come to Paul, you automatically think that the Jesus Christ that he's talking about is the Jesus Christ you've just been reading about in the Gospels. And it took scholars quite a few centuries before they went and investigated Paul. What does he actually say about this Jesus figure? And what's amazing is that if you investigate Paul's original letters, his real letters, because there are quite a few forgeries in the New Testament, he makes no historical mention of a Jesus at all. In fact, when he comes to talk about uh, the great secret that's been stored up from the beginning of time that he's going to reveal to his, his listeners, he doesn't say it's that Jesus was born down the road in a shed and he's the son. He says the secret is this, Christ in you. So for Paul, if you read his letters, and I urge anybody to, to read them with an open mind, you will construct a cosmic Jesus Christ who never had any existence. You'll, you'll never hear anything about his parents, Mary and Joseph. You'll never hear anything about a virgin birth. You won't hear anything about where he was crucified. Or These are cosmic events. And, and I think the most telling of all is, you know, if you've been around anyone who has had a recently dead guru, even if they hadn't met them themselves, as Paul clearly says, he, he, he met a vision of light. Yeah. They, they, you know, oh, he did this, he said that, or, you know, I heard a story about... Because that's their way of proving their connection it's with the It's all about the quotes from the guru. In Paul, yeah. we have none of this. Yeah. We simply have this figure that you die and resurrect with, and then you discover the Christ within. And that's the message of the Gnostic Christians, who don't believe in an historical Jesus. And it's also the message of the ancient mysteries, where the same figure was called by different names but was essentially also someone that you mystically died and resurrected or come back, came back, you come back to life with or through. Mm. Yeah. Paul, Paul, is, Paul writes in the, in the language of the mysteries and the language of the Gnostics, and he's a, he's a much misunderstood figure. Yeah. And the traditional uh, orthodox view would be many people call Paul the earliest heretic because they have a vision of uh, Jesus came to bring his message and Paul slightly distorted it and added a lot of Greek mythology and all the rest of it. Actually, if you turn the two around, what happened is that Paul came first with his Gnostic cosmic Christ. And then the literalist came along and fashioned a story and perverted Paul's original message. Uh, we have a squeaky chair problem. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Has that been going off a lot? Mm -hmm. Is that me? Mm -hmm. oh. Now, this is where things get interesting, because if there was a way to manifest this Christ consciousness back then, there must be a way to achieve this today. This led us into a discussion about Holy Communion. It's very interesting that we can see on some carvings of Dionysus, where it, he's, he's done as an effigy with a, a kind of cross-like structure in which this image is suspended. And then at the bottom, there's bread and wine. Mm -hmm. We also have a, an inscription, which is believed to be Mithraic, which says, if you take bread and wine, you will commune with the God-man, with, with Mithras in this case. And then we've got it also in Christianity. So this is clearly something which has been going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. And there, there's every possibility, I think, that in the ancient world, and maybe for the... Uh, Gnostics, that this was a profoundly not just a mystical experience, a symbolic experience, but possibly a, a psychedelic one, that there would have been, um, uh, the wine would have been far more transformative than it is today, um, because the descriptions which people give of partaking in this, and especially in the mysteries, the pagan mysteries, is very extreme. They're having, you know, one hell of an experience yeah. from something. Yeah, yeah. And I do think it probably goes back to an ancient, I mean, the, the myth of Dionysus, for example, is that as a child, he is torn apart and eaten by the 12 Titans, who are the ancient forces of Earth. And Zeus is angry that his son has been eaten by these Earth beings. 
destroys them, and from the from the uh, flesh of the Titans is created humanity. So all of humanity have a spark of Dionysus inside them because they have eaten of the God. And the mysteries was designed to purify human nature so that you shed your human nature, your titanic nature, and the spirit is revealed, the spirit of Dionysus. Now, I think there is a connection. Many classicists think there is a connection. Behind any myth, there was an earlier ritual. So the myth explains the ritual, the ritual explains the meal. So I think at the heart of the Eleusinian mysteries was perhaps a demonstration of it itself. Twelve people eating the body of the God, which, of course, is exactly the vision you have at the Last Supper. Twelve people eating the body of the God. And I think that is an explanation in the ancient world of how the divine spark is in us. How is it that human beings are not just animals? We are different from animals. We are not just earthly. There's a divine spark in us. And I think this explanation is, you know, comes from this ancient cultic practice. And as Tim said, you know, the, the early Christians themselves said, yes, we know in the mysteries of Mithras, you eat the body and drink the blood of the God. Well, actually, I think it was water then in the, in the Mithraic mysteries. So they acknowledge perfectly openly that the Eucharist happens inside Mithraism. Um, and I think it was a part of all the mysteries, to be honest. I think there was a cultic meal symbolizing eating the body of the God. So for the select few, the mystery was revealed, while everyone else was fed the myth, or the religion. And this left a gap between those who had the direct experience and those who had only heard tales or rumors about it. The masses received the placebo while the clergy dined with the gods. Soon the myth became legend, and the legend was remembered as history. Before long, the entire process became a part of an elaborate initiation. What you see with the Gnostics, I think, is that there's a process by which you come to this Gnosis. And I think they're quite happy uh, for people to take the story literally to begin with. Hmm. I think there's a level in which you understand that in that way. So the first initiation for them, it, it's called the psychic initiation, which just, psyche just means soul. So it's the soul initiation. It's the initiation into your deeper being, who you really are. From the body. From, from the body. soma into psyche. And so from you the get, body, from literal into yeah, metaphorical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you've got hillix or materialists becoming yeah. psychics. And there's a, an element then of belief that you kind of, and I think we all go through this on the spiritual journey. You, the first thing you do is you look to somebody else mm -hmm. and you have a figure and, and Jesus is a wonderful figure through whom people can communicate with the mystery of existence, God, yeah. whatever name you give to it. But that at a certain point in the process, they would enter another level of initiation, which was called the pneumatic, which means spiritual, spiritual initiation. And at that point, the, they would be taken aside or got the, taken through a process, probably both, in which the story was unpacked, the meaning was unpacked, and they start to realize, oh, Jesus isn't somebody out there. Jesus is a representation of something in me. Mm -hmm. And that's the discovery which leads to the Christ within. And that's the, so the, so the first level, the soul level, is maybe about belief, but the second, the spiritual level, is about spirit or essence. And that's about discovering that if you discover your own deeper self... It's the self, so that the Christ is the Gnostic's way of talking about what the ancient pagans called the Osiris within or the Dionysus within, and which in, Hindu, in, in Hinduism would be the Atman, in, in Buddhism would be the Buddha nature, and it's that thing we all call I. And the great mystical revelation is there's one of us. If you come into the deepest place, there's just one of us. And, and the, 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 the Christi, Christian mysteries like the pagan mysteries, was all about discovering that essential oneness. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. And like Paul says, you know, that we are all parts of one body. He's using the Christ thing. He says we are all parts of the body of Christ. And it's this idea that we share an essential oneness. But you come into it through separateness. Everybody arrives at the beginning as a separate individual. And so these processes that people go through, sometimes there are three stages, sometimes there are four, you know, it's, 
it's quite fluid, quite flexible, but they represent these, these changes from a physical understanding of something to a metaphorical understanding to an allegorical to eventually a mystical understanding. Because I think that the upper level is where you realise that you are the Christ. Yeah. You are the person who is a God who has come to earth as just an ordinary person who must suffer and die for a crime that they didn't commit. And then you begin to realise, oh, it's, it's, it's all about me. And, and the, the levels of initiation are in the, in the Jesus myth itself. Yeah. The, the key moment, well, the, well some, probably the earliest story, Jesus' story, began with the baptism. And it's the key moment because that begins the psychic initiation, which is about being cleansed. It's about becoming a better person. So you, and then after that, you get Jesus giving all of these teachings, wonderful teachings, loving your enemies and all that, which will help you become a more spiritual, better person. And, and you, you, it's personal transformation, we call it today. Yeah. And that looks like the whole thing's been done and he rides into Jerusalem as a king and he's like, yeah, and that's where you get to on your journey. You think, hey, I'm really getting this. And then everything turns around and, and suddenly it's about being put to death. And finding you're not a person at all, that your deeper identity is God, is this one awareness. So that you let, he then has to go through this whole process, which each one of us goes through, of dying to the separate self and waking up as something much, much, much bigger. I think it's elemental as well. There's a definite um, allusion in all of this to earth, water, air and fire as a process. So like Tim says, you have the baptism that starts it off. Jesus says himself, I've come to baptize not just with water, but with fire. Mm. We know that in certain other mist of the mysteries, um, they used wind, they, they like sm the smudging thing yeah. that they do in, they use uh, the air, they used a winnowing fan. So there's this idea of that each individual, because we are composed of these increasingly rarefied elements, that in some way the journey back to the source must go through this, these elements from the, the heaviness of earth through water, air, until eventually one returns to spirit, which is fine. And I think it's all, it's all there in the Jesus story, as it was in all the mysteries as well. And we'll discuss initiations and these sacred plants again in just a few minutes, but this conversation changed gears as we started talking about psychedelic mushrooms, which, and you'll see why in episode four, led to a conversation about Christmas. I love celebrating Christmas because uh, I have children, and that makes all the difference. For me, it's about... Well, like all these stories and myths and fairy tales, there's something which engages us with a mind that we, we're in in childhood, the imaginary mind. And as we get older, we learn to discriminate further so that we can leave that behind. But how lovely, especially when you have children, it's much easier to come back and enter that. So to have a thing where you're full of, you know, a Christmas tree and it's all sparkling and there's gifts and time stops. For me, it's about playing. I have a chance to stop all my activity as a grown up in the world and just focus on playing and play. And I love that. So you, and in this myth, I see my children do the nativity story and you know, it's beautiful because it's a, it's a very old, it's a very beautiful story. I don't have a problem with any of that. I think, you know, I'm very, very pro all of that. The only thing I want to add is, you know, just as a certain point in their lives, they will figure out there's no Santa Claus. At a certain point in their lives, they need to also figure out that that is also a myth. Mm -hmm. And what's encouraging about the children I see in the UK, at least, is they all pretty much figure that out pretty quickly mm -hmm. now. Yeah. And we're leaving that behind. And that's really good. And then we can celebrate. You see, I would like to see the whole of religion become like a, a cultural artifact, something which we, you know, a bit like country dancing or something. No, no one really takes it seriously, but we enjoy it because it's lovely. It's kind of our heritage. So we're not in it anymore. And then when we're free from it, we can take the good bits and leave the bad bits. And if we can do that with, with all of the, our religious heritage, we can take the Bible, for instance, and go, you know, let's just take, you know, let's take love your enemies. Fantastic. You know, there's a lot of stuff in there, just wonderful, challenging, deep stuff. But we can leave the gnashing of teeth. You know, we don't need that anymore. No. And, and it's that ability to take what works and leave behind. That's what the evolution of culture is. But you don't abandon the past, 
and all the beautiful music and the buildings and the traditions. We, we, we just see it differently. Mm. I bet you don't celebrate Christmas at all. I don't have children. I hate Christmas. <laughs> Bar humbug. <laughs> I say to you. After, after Peter and I had written the Jesus Mysteries, we played uh, with the idea of maybe doing the Santa Mysteries because you suddenly saw that the same thing was going on. And I, I experienced this myself with my first time I, with my son when I became Santa. And I said, oh, look, hang on. I started as a child and I really believed there was a Santa Claus. He was a figure out there, this amazing being who came and gave me things for no, you know, no reason. If I was good enough, you know, but he came and showered gifts on me. And then I learned there wasn't a Santa. And then I discovered I became Santa. And here I was kind of embodying a God. Here I was tiptoeing around the house with this big bag of gifts, which I'd worked really hard to, to buy. And I was gonna put them at the end of the bed and pretend it was Santa. And I wasn't gonna take any of the credit. And for that brief moment, I became the spirit of generosity. I just gave it all away. Mm. And you see the same thing in the Jesus story. You know, you start off thinking he's a figure out there who's gonna save you. And then you discover, no, there isn't a figure out there who's gonna save you. And then if you keep going with the process, you find that there's a figure in you, your deeper self, which is going to save you. In fact, it doesn't even need to save you because just in the discovering of it, you are saved. The word, you know, when you hear all this time, Jesus saves, what the, the, in the Greek, what that means is, is to be made permanent. You discover something in you which just is permanent. Mm -hmm. It's beyond birth and death. It just is. And that's the greatest relief you can possibly imagine. Peter briefly mentioned Addis earlier, and I thought it would be good timing to draw a connection between Addis and the Christmas tree. Uh, the festival of Attis, which was celebrated in Rome around the uh, vernal equinox, I think, the spring equinox, uh, a pine tree was brought in and was set up. Now, it's a mystery, so we really don't know what really happened in the mysteries of Attis. But we know that the pine tree was integral to it. I suspect that, this is my gut feeling, I'm not really sure I've got evidence for this, that in this, the, the tree always represents the goddess. And one finds this in the Jewish tradition as well. We find in, in a lot of archaeological, a, a, a post was set up or a tree was set up called the Asherah. And that was Jehovah's Asherah, his consort. So I think that represents the female principle. And hung on the tree was the figure of the God, Attis or uh, Jesus as it is in the Jesus story. And I think that represents the two forces, the eternal continuing force of nature, which is eternal and continues. And hence the pine tree, which is a coat which doesn't drop its leaves. It's green all year round, which the Greeks saw as something quite miraculous. And on that is hung the nature god, who is the son of nature, who is the life, which blooms in the spring and flowers in the summer and then dies in the autumn and is buried in the earth. And I think that relationship between the eternal mother and her ever-living, ever-dying son is obvious in Christianity, it is obvious in the Attis mysteries, it's obvious in most of the mysteries, as those two polarised uh, forces. I mean, in the Christian thing, the palm becomes a symbol of, of victory. Again, it's an evergreen plant. And, and, and ivy is a symbol of Dionysus. It's an evergreen. It's always there. It doesn't die. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's eternal. So I think there's, yeah, I mean, there's, Christmas is full of pagan, <laughs> pagan regalia. Yeah. Of course, anyone who knows me will tell you that I'll throw the Amanita muscaria mushroom into the mix along with Addis and the pine tree. But instead of going this direction, we started talking about some of the things that people get caught up on when they're trying to either step away from such a firm belief in the Christian story or something people use to give that story some valid historic presence. Josephus was the first name to surface. Josephus is a Jewish historian. He's a kind of, he's a, he works for the Romans. He's a paid employee to write appropriate histories. And there's a little passage in Josephus 
which is quite remarkable. And it gets wheeled out all the time, you know, taken very seriously, you'll hear it on... If you went on an alpha course in this country, a Christian training course, you would be given this as one of the key witnesses to the his historicity of Jesus. And the reason it's so important is because although there are some mentions in other texts of historians of Christians, vaguely, there's nothing which would, would be real evidence. There's nothing for the man. Mm. And yet here, in this Jewish historian, there's a whole passage where he talks about Jesus in the most glowing terms, and uh, as the Messiah, as, as just, and it's just the evidence that everyone's looking for, mm. except it's a terribly, terribly bad forgery. And the fact that it's a forgery is what really makes it interesting. Yeah, and it's not just, I mean, <coughs> uh, uh, Edward Gibbon, who wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, 200 years ago, called the passage in Josephus a vulgar forgery. Now, I don't think even today you could find a classicist with a greater control of the sources and knowledge of the documents of the ancient world than Gibbon. And if he calls it a vulgar forgery, and by vulgar he means it's not even a good forgery, <laughs> you only have to go and look at the other texts. You only have to listen to Oregon, who was a second century Christian, Gnostic Christian, who says categorically there is no mention of the Messiah, of Jesus, in Josephus. And yet only a hundred years later, Eusebius, who is Constantine's official biographer, his spin doctor, produces a copy of Josephus's work in which this passage exists for the first time. Now, to understand who Eusebius is, he's called the father of church history. Even the editor of his book in Penguin today says he's dishonest and unreliable. Edward Gibbon says he, he says that Eusebius himself says, I have only included what redounds to the glory of the church and omitted everything else. So he's broken the fundamental rule of history. Now it turns out that he, uh, people who study handwriting styles, trace the, the passage to Eusebius himself. The passage uses terminology that Josephus never uses, but the Eusebius uses again and again. He refers, for example, to the tribe of Christians. This is not a phrase that Josephus would recognise. Tribe means ethnicity for him. By Eusebius's time, it's come to mean the tribe of Christians, the brotherhood of Christians. So all Eusebius' fingerprints are all over it. Now, what I think is fascinating about the Josephus passage uh, that really isn't remarked. And I first read this in a book by a Carmelite nun in the 50s. She was a nun from a very young age. And then she investigated the same evidence we've investigated and came to believe that it was all a story. And she says that Josephus is a witness, but not in the way that the church would want it to be. Actually, because he's a very early writer, writing at the end of the first century AD, and he's a Jew, he's lived in Palestine, all the rest of it, the fact that he doesn't mention Jesus and somebody's put in a forgery three centuries later shows that even at this early date, there was no evidence for an historical Jesus. And so they had to make him up with what is called a vulgar forgery. And it is still, I mean, the fact that it's still being wheeled out to this day to prove the history shows that people just aren't listening. If, if Edward Gibbon could say that 200 years ago, and it still hasn't sunk in to the majority of people that the evidence, the supposed evidence of the history of Jesus is all forgery, then, well, what have we been doing for 200 years? Okay, but that still leaves the legend that we all know. The story of Jesus, born under a star in a manger, or was it a cave? But what about the legend? The question we get a lot is, if there was, there must have been a Jesus, because how else would this have happened, that this, this religion would have taken over the world? You know, someone had to start it, and of course someone did. And there's a huge amount of wisdom put into the mouth of Jesus, and somebody wrote that, somebody said that. What we're saying is that it wasn't the figure in the story that said that, you know, any more that it wasn't Hamlet who said all those beautiful words, it was Shakespeare. But he, there was still someone behind it and then his work of genius. 
And to just see how things spread without a founder, you've only got to look at Mithraism. If it hadn't been for the quirk that Constantine became a Christian, we could all probably now be discussing, was there a real Mithras? Because Mithraism was a huge cult across the whole of the ancient world. The biggest. Yeah, yeah. Just massive. But we don't go looking for a real Mithras. And that's the key. Mm. Things can happen over time. They just develop. Yeah. They just develop. And that had been going on for a very, very, very long time. It is just because of that literalism because the Christian, you know, these myths have been around for each cult had its myth of the ever living, ever dying, resurrecting God man. Um, and it's only because Christianity discovered probably by just a mere vagary, you know, in, in the, the marketplace of Rome in the end of the second century, there were a myriad of cults. Rome had drawn in people from all over it, all peddling their mystical wares and their fantastic Very much stories. like today. Very much like today, yeah. And the Christians came up with a, this new angle. No, everything that you're talking about, this is all myths. Our story really, truly happened. Now, once you've done that, great, you're going to get, you've got a new take on an old, old story. It's just what every marketing person wants. But you're then hoist on your own petard. Because if you can't back that up with evidence that this really happened, you start looking stupid. And that's why we see in the early years of Christianity a veritable fantasy factory where people were just producing. Celsus, one of the pagan critics, was saying, you can't argue with these Christians because you say to them, this never happened. They run away, they write down something, and then they come <laughs> back and they say, look, it's in here. So I presume they were all doing the, the same thing. And of course, what the, the people who first literalised it did was then make the whole of the church a hostage to fortune because for for centuries millennia nobody really could check it or verify it or investigate the sources or had any interest in doing it uh, palestine the eastern mediterranean was closed anyway it's an arabic you know christian scholars couldn't nobody could go now we live in a forensic age where people are going back and they're investigating the sources there are archaeologists swarming over the middle east and we will make you know a scientific hypothesis is you, 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 can't, you can't prove it, but you can, me, you can make it predictive. It will predict certain things. And we will predict that there will be no artefact that verifies the Jesus story ever found. There are many artefacts that turn up in Jerusalem antiquities markets all the time, claim to be the bone box of Jesus or a nail from the tree. All of them will be disproved because no such historical figure actually occurred. It was just a literalist marketing technique and it worked, which is why we're discussing it today. And a, a very important thing for us is that we don't know there was no Jesus. You can't know. You can't that. prove a negative. You can't know that. So at the end of the day, you're just balancing evidence. Mm -hmm. And so you just stand back and you go, okay, so which was more likely? This evolution of ideas which had already been happening whereby Jewish and pagan motifs were being combined and that just continued and we got the Jesus story or God made a once only visit to planet earth was supernaturally born of a virgin walked on water died and resurrected and then kind of left us to it you just uh, do you know what Actually, this one's a lot more plausible. Mm. And that's, the, that's the, the place you have to end up in. Yeah. What I love about the approach that we've taken, though, is it doesn't diminish Christianity. Actually, it brings it to life. Mm. It goes, this is even more important than we thought, because it's actually about each one of us discovering who we really and are. And also, when you connect it with its ancient sources... You don't have a story which is, you know, this story has been beguiling the West for 2,000 years. But when you realise that it's a, it's a continuation of pagan stories and that they go back into ancient Egypt, you're then, the Osiris legend comes to us right in the earliest pyramids, two and a half thousand years BC. They were telling the same story. So it really is the greatest story ever told. It fascinates people. Of course it does. Who wouldn't want the promise of immortality? That, end, that the end of your life, for all of your efforts and all of your suffering, you will go to a blessed place where it will all make sense and you will enjoy, you know, who wouldn't want to buy into that thing? But let's make no mistake about it. It's the greatest story ever told, but it is 
a story. And that's when Peter told me about an ancient Gnostic text. Which is fascinating, which talks about the, the, the birth of Jesus. And it describes an enormous cave in which a light suddenly appears. And then when the light goes, there is a child. And we think that this image of the cave, which is one of the earliest images, goes back to Plato's cave which is one of the famous analogies for anybody who was, you know, who went to the gymnasia, wrote out, you know, trial bits of Plato, they would be totally familiar with the myth of the cave. I think that's very important to understand exactly how that, just as today there are, you know, if I said to you the force or lightsaber, you'd immediately jump yeah. to Star Wars. You don't, I wouldn't have to say, you know, like in Star Wars, that in their literature they could make a reference to the cave and you go, oh yeah, like in yeah. Plato or Pythagoras, probably yeah. goes back to it. So Plato's cave, in which we are all prisoners, is what Plato says. We are in this cave, we are watching shadows on the wall and mistaking them for reality, whilst the true source of light is from the mouth of the cave. And Plato even says, what would happen if a wise person came from the sunlight into the cave and said to people, look, you're just looking at shadows, this is not the real world. And then he says they would probably kill him. And this is, of course, what happens to Jesus. He comes, is born into the world, the bright light recedes and a baby is left. And this baby grows up and leads its life within the world. And they, the ancients figured because, uh, uh, the, the, the world as a cave. Mm. Because we're in this dark night when the, you know, we're, we're in this dark. And the real uh, universe of light is outside of that. The stars are little holes in the darkness through which the light comes through. That's our true home, heaven. That's where we want to get to. And Jesus follows this paradigm exactly. So that at the end of his life, after he's died, he's buried back in a cave. And then when the disciples come to seek him, they find that the cave is empty. And it's exactly that. Jesus has been born into the world, into Plato's cave. He has delivered his message to people. Look, this is not your true home. You are from beyond where I am from and I've come to take you home and and that's exactly how the story unfolds. As we were discussing celestial mythology Peter really honed in on sun worship and solar mythology. I think there's a lot of solar mythology in the Jesus story as well as there's astrological motifs there are probably psychedelic motifs there's a whole lot of Jewish mythology but also there are a lot there's a lot of solar mythology and you could say that Jesus is not just the son of God s-o-n but the son of God s-u-n and if you look at his the the, the 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 gospel story the important moments the uh he's born at the precise moment when the sun is reborn in the depths of winter the the equinox um then Easter is, is the next important date. And I think, in, although in, in the Jesus stories there, there, there aren't any other focal points, there are in, in other myths. And I think what they were playing with, Plato talks about the Son of God crucified in the cosmos, is that the Son, it was the realisation in the ancient world, the Son was considered to be the greatest symbol of the divine. And then as scholars began to study it, they realised that the sun itself followed this course, which was mapped out by the two solstices and the two equinoxes. And that the sun itself, therefore, was subject to outside laws, was not the highest god. And I think there's a kind of motif, this, this idea, therefore, of a cross of light, that the sun itself is bound onto a cross is the imagery that you see quite clearly in, in Christianity. Jesus is portrayed with the nimbus rays of the sun when he's resurrected. So it's that idea that he is not just um, a representation of the divine in man, but also a representation of the, of the sun that dies in the winter, that goes away and then comes back and is reborn. And starts with the star. Mm. Uh, you know, the star is a hole in the, the veneer of separateness, the goddess, like knew it, this starry darkness. 
and it starts with a big star, a big hole in the appearances. The star of Bethlehem. And what I love about that is that, you know, it's saying, in the, ancient, the Egyptians, right back to the Egyptians, you know, said, we're all really, we're really a star. Mm. And it sounds mad, you know, what, a big exploding ball of gas? No, they can't be right. But they didn't see it like that, obviously. They saw it like we're all holes in the appearances. And when we look at each other, when we look in each other's eyes, we look through a hole in the appearances. To what? To something we can't see or to consciousness or touch. We don't know what it is, we, but it's there. And we look through the appearances and we connect with each other. And that's really what the mysteries is all about. It's about seeing our real nature is, is not in the appearances. It's something much deeper than that. And connecting through the appearances with the source of light, of mm. consciousness. Mm. And I think there was a real split in the ancient world between body and spirit. These were two, uh, two separate, dis distinct things. And the whole idea was about getting away. You know, this is why Jesus' body, you know, the whole idea of being crucified, of the body being removed from the body, then the soul can fly free, can go to its, to its home. And that's what Plato says as well. I mean, he says we, we have come from a star and when each of us dies, we go back to our star. Well, at the end of the Jesus... Um, story, you know, when he's crucified, the the veil of the temple is ripped in two, isn't yeah. it? and the veil of the temple was a picture of the night sky. Yeah, a whole image of the heavens, the so zodiac, the, the, stars, the veil, the which is the dream of life, the goddess, the appearances, is is opened, and as Paul says, he conquers the cosmos. He comes yeah. out into the light, yeah, and is therefore uh, no longer imprisoned in the in the appearances, yeah. and that's what the that's what the gnosis is. The gnosis is ah. I think I'm imprisoned in this body. I'm thinking, and really, it's the other way around. I'm the, this vast awareness. I'm the Christ. I'm the, I'm the presence of the big mind of God. And within me, there are these appearances. And as you, as you, you think you're in it, you're kind of stuck in this small little uh, cave. You, you're caught in a, in a box. And then you come out, and you're in this big empty space. And that's the transformation the whole story is leading you to. The veil being opened, coming into the light, no longer being imprisoned by your appearances. This to me sounds like ego death from a psychedelic experience. I mean, after a while it just becomes obvious that psychedelic, sacred plants and mushrooms were used to achieve these higher states of consciousness. I think uh, it's almost inevitable that uh, psychedelics have been playing a part in... Uh, religious mystical experiences since the beginning of time they are a powerful way for human beings to blow their little egos out of the water and contact the divine i mean one thing you know the whole of spirituality has its roots ancient roots in the shamanic traditions mm. and we still have those traditions yeah and a, a huge number of them are based on whatever the indigenous psychedelic happens to be in that area mm. Because what could be more natural than you pick up a mushroom or something like that, you ingest it, and my God, you're having visions. You're seeing life in a new way. You're seeing through the appearances. You have a greater understanding, or at least your, your, the confines of your common sense understanding is exploded. And it's transformational. Yeah. So, but as regards, because, uh, and this is the problem with the ancient pagan mysteries in general, they were mysteries. Everybody who participated was sworn to secrecy. And what's incredible, that the mysteries of Eleusis were celebrated for a thousand years in the Greek world. Many people, Roman emperors, Cicero, Seneca, we get a, all the greats, were initiates. None of them broke their oath and told us what happened. But we know that initiates drank a drink before they began on the sacred way to Eleusis, which was a painful purgatorial process. They were beaten by people with rods. Uh, it was m meant to be a, a visceral, physical experience. And I feel that it was, it was certainly heightened by fasting. So whatever, if they did take anything then, we know that that would have been intensified, because it always is when you, when you, when you fast beforehand. Uh, archaeologists have found opium pipes at Eleusis, so we've got enough hints to know. And they, the ancients were master pharmacopoeists. They, they, they knew all of the intoxicating. And it, as Tim says, it came out of the shamanic tradition. There isn't a shamanic tradition that doesn't use power plants, I don't think. Not the oldest ones, I'd say. So it's kind of inevitable, but the clues, again, you know, it's very, very difficult. We haven't focused on this area in our work, but 
um, there's a guy called uh, Michael Hoffman who uh, has investigated this area and produced a lot of lucid work. And his point of view, and I think quite rightly, is like, if Paul and other people are eating the body of the God and having an incredible visionary... I mean, Paul says, again, it just completely contradicts the idea of a historical Jesus, because he says, everything I know about Jesus came to me by revelation. Where is this coming from? What is the source of his experiences? I wouldn't be at all surprised. I mean... Uh, a chap called John Allegra many years ago wrote a, a book, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, which was about precisely this. He believes that uh, the cultic meal of sharing the book was people getting together and eating some psychoactive substance together and having revelations of the Holy Spirit, what have you. So I'm, I'm open to, to any investigations and whatever evidence comes up. You know, I think it's through personal experience myself one of the most powerful ways to, well, Aldous Huxley himself, where in, uh, is it Heaven and Hell? Doors of Perception. Doors of Perception, when he, see, when he looks at the, um, the bamboo chair, I think it is, and he says, I suddenly, and this is a man who spent his entire life writing about the religious traditions of the world, the mystical traditions of the world, but he never actually had an experience. And here he was on mescaline, I believe, mm -hmm looking at this chair suffused with light and he says here all these words that people had used before like grace and all these mis suddenly i was having that experience which is fantastic i think didn't he die on lsd, LSD. yeah uh, alan watts the same uh, again a great scholar actually had the experience in this way so if that's happening to people today i think we can safely assume it's been happening to people for a very very long time yeah now, of course, people have mystical experiences in other ways, that's for sure. Uh, but it is one of the ways. I've just thought there is an illustration. It's used on Robert Graves' Greek myths, uh, uh, which is one maenad, wh who were the female followers of Dionysus, holding up a mushroom yeah. to another right. one. Do you remember that yeah. one? It's yeah. on the cover of the Graves thing. It's an illustration. So there are numerous hints you know, that this was going on. I wouldn't be at all surprised if it's... I'd go further. I'd say, I'd, I, really, I'd be surprised if it wasn't true. Yeah. What we can't say, and the reason that um, Peter and I haven't pushed it in our, our research, is because if you're coming out and saying, Jesus doesn't exist, it's such a confronting thing for most people that we've tried to keep to everything we can absolutely meticulously back up. But here is another possibility which others have looked into much more deeply than we have, and yet really, you know, it would be such a surprise to see such a, uh, a powerfully transformative process going on that didn't draw on this in some way, because they didn't have the same taboos which we've, we've now got around changing consciousness. Yeah. But today those taboos exist, and the masses still get the placebo, while the true experience is what has become taboo. And this led us into a conversation about Holy Communion. With the communion where you take the wine and the bread, it works for people because it's done in a ritual context. People do have profound experiences, but I think very often, certainly over time, you know, it's a bit of a letdown, really. Mm. Uh, what is probably uh, the case originally is that the wine would have been suffused with something. Mm. And also that the bread itself, there's a, a um, psychedelic... Um, Fungi. Well, that's where Which, LSD is, is synthesized from ergot of rye. Yeah. And they believe that at certain points when, when, the, when the bread was infected, and the medieval um, St. Vitus dance, for example, yeah. if, the, if, the, if the, the fungus has attacked the crop before it's turned into bread, the bread itself becomes psychedelic. Becomes psychedelic. And there were many eruptions in the Middle Ages, in particularly damp summers, when the ergot would flourish, when people would would would, would go kind of crazy. And, it, and if that's so, true, then you know the way to understand religion is you've gone from a yeah. powerfully transformative event where you would take these psychoactives in a ritual <coughs> context, uh, probably alongside some sort of ritual death, mm -hmm. and your state of consciousness utterly transformed yeah. to uh, a little little bit of white wafer and some. Uh, a tiny sip of wine in a, in, a, in a context where you're going to go back and sing. But Victorian I think it hymns. must always be the function of organised religion to neuter, 
to emasculate the mystical experience. Because what you don't want is people having their own access to the divine. So if people are taking a divine and then having their own personal act, they don't need you. Mm. What, what the whole the point of organised religion <laughs> is to mediate the divine. They are the intermediaries between you and God. That's the way organised religion works. So it must always, and I think it happened in Hinduism with Soma, if you read the Rig Veda, all the Vedic hymns, out of a thousand, I think 990 are hymns to Soma. It is the, the blood of the gods, it's the vision of eternity, it's the white gleaming swan of eternity. It's like, But now in Hindu culture, Soma is just a milky drink. And I think the same process has gone on. People have realised if you want to actually control people, you have to shut down their access. And it's certainly what happened with Gnosticism. Gnosticism said, no, God is in you, like Paul said, Christ is in you. That's fatal for organised religion, because then everybody can have their own personal relationship with Christ. Why do I need to go to church to experience Christ? I can do it on my own. And I think that's, you know, it's, it's inevitable, really. It's very hot in here. Uh, can't do much with that without noise. No. I can cool it down for a bit if you want to. Do you need to have a break? Do you? Yeah, you're looking a bit shiny. I'm very shiny. Yeah. Mm. Shiny, happy people. Do you want to cool it down for it? Yeah. Okay, I'll do the roll. And just like that, we took a break. And while we were outside talking, I mentioned how fascinating it was to me that back then, the newer, better myth could just swallow up the others, but still be built upon those very same myths it was swallowing up. Timothy laughed and said, some of them are literally built upon those older myths. At the place where, the, where there is now stands the Vatican, there was once a sanctuary to Mithras, who was the most significant of the dying and resurrecting godmen before Jesus, immediately before Jesus became popular. So historically, I love that because it, it's actually in, in, the, in the ground, underneath the ground, there are these ancient sanctuaries. And you'll find it all over. They, you'll find that pagan uh, sites have been built on. Mm. And we look at that, you know, well, there's political reasons for that. It's kind of the obvious evolution. It's, you know, the past is underneath. And mm. the, but also it works in terms of culture, mm. that our ideas are based on what's gone before. Yeah. And that symbolizes perfectly for us the situation with Christianity. Mm. It, um, just peel away this thing and then underneath, oh, look. Yeah. There's where it came from. It yeah. didn't just arrive from nowhere. Nothing yeah. ever does. Yeah. Yeah, because I think that's the great you know, problem with Christianity, is it, it creates a sort of year zero, like communism did. Literally. Or, or Pol Pot in Cambodia. Literally. Yeah. Um, and then it gives you an idea that Christianity sprang, fully formed into the world, this new revelation. And if you accept that, then it does look like a new thing. But like I say, the Christians had to destroy all the evidence before them. I mean... To the best of my knowledge, that has never happened. When the Buddha came along in India and started preaching against the, the Brahmins of the time, the priests of the time, and criticising them, the Buddhists, when they, they didn't destroy every single Hindu temple and establish a, you know, they just seamlessly integrated with the culture that was there. Whereas the West has gone through this massive schism that it, it thinks that everything before the year zero for us uh, is not even worth thinking about or, or, or discussing or anything. And that this is the ultimate revelation. Once you realise that the, the new is always built on the old and that there are no new ideas in history, there are just the evolution, then you begin to realise and you can actually see how a God figure may change its name and remain exactly the same. But unless you can, you can see... I mean, the example we use is... Um, uh, Romeo and Juliet and West Side Story. You know, if you can't see that this this is the same story, 400 years between them, completely different locations, everything, but the same basic story. If you can't understand that, you won't see how the Jesus story is like the Osiris story or the Dionysus story, because you'll be so distracted by, well, the names are different and this is different. Once you begin to understand the mythological archetypes that are being used, you can see that all these stories are one story. Of course, if you go back to the first few centuries, 
you don't find Christians treating it there as if Christianity has just come from nowhere so much because they have got the problem that they know the pagan myths. It's not like today. Most people, you say, look, these pagan myths, which are like the Jesus story, exist. It's a revelation. Yeah, they've never heard. It was for us when we started our research because no one tells you these things. You have to find them. But in the, in the ancient world, of course, it was obvious. What, what, what is fascinating is the different reactions you get. And that's where you can see this clear division in early Christianity between two types of Christian, which we call literalists and Gnostics. For the Gnostics, the explanation for why these ancient pagan myths are so similar to the Jesus story is Jesus is the same myth. Mm. He is, they, in one of their texts, they call him many-faced Attis. He is Attis, another face of Attis. He's the same perennial God-man in a, in a Jewish form as Joshua. He, he, but for the literalists, and they're not arising really until the end of the second century, but at that time, how can they explain this? They've got an historical Jesus. How can these myths predate it? And yet they do. <coughs> so they come up with this fantastic theory, which I still get thrown at me a lot uh, when I talk about this. It, 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 the devil did it. The devil came in advance. It's canny, the devil. He created all these myths so that when Jesus really did come, everyone would be very confused. It's kind of plagiarism by anticipation. He's done it before it happened. Uh, and that's where you're left with that sort of absurdity. The fact it's the that, only way you can the fact that the first Christians we know of have to resort to this <laughs> argument of diabolical mimicry to explain the similarities between the cult that they're peddling and all the cults that have gone before show you that something's going on. But as Tim has said, because most people, know, you know, because the Christians obliterated all of that so effectively, it comes as a revelation to people today that Mithras was born on the 25th of December. It's like, well, hang on, that's Jesus' birthday. It was a well before Jesus, there was Mithras, and it's the same story. So I thought I would end this interview with one word that would summarize this Christ consciousness. Ecstasy. Ecstasy. Stepping out. That's what, that's what the, the mystical experience is. It's mm. one of ecstasy. And whilst it, it's difficult to look at the, specifically, the, at least the Gnostic and the pagan initiations and go, oh, this was what was used, and we don't have that. We can guess, but we don't. What we do know is that an initiation, well, first of all, the word, certainly in, in the Greek word that gets used, doesn't mean, like our word, the start of something. It comes from telos, and it means kind of a glimpse of the end of something. So what's happening to you in an initiation is that you're getting a, an experience of where you're going. So you, oh, and then you come back and then you make the journey back to that place and you're finding it in yourself. Now, one of the things that psychedelics does is it gives you a glimpse of something which has been kind of given to you from the outside in. You've needed to ingest this thing and something's happened to your consciousness. It's a very powerful way of doing that. And so the idea that you could have an initiation, a glimpse of the end through something which you is taken into you through psychedelic, or also through the influence of a teacher or, or, or a ritual, or maybe all of it. And then you're on the journey to find that in yourself mm. because it's already in you. Mm. That's what I think is going on one way or another. Okay, so that's it for episode two of The Lost Interviews. Remember to visit bluehoney.org. Each of these episodes have a corresponding webpage with images and more details. Just go to bluehoney.org, follow the link to Blue Honey Radio, and there you will see this episode listed under the Lost Interviews. And while you're there, be sure to check out our new t-shirts on sale. All of the profits for everything sold on my website will be used to make this podcast better. So, as always, I want to thank everyone for showing your support. You can also show your support by checking us out on Patreon. You can find the link on bluehoney.org or go to patreon.com backslash bluehoney. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com backslash bluehoney. For updates and some random thoughts, be sure to follow me on Twitter at bluehoney underscore org. That's bluehoney underscore o-r-g. Be on the lookout for episode number three of The Lost Interviews. In this edition, we explore the world of altered states with Dr. Dennis McKenna. Until then, stay tuned, everybody. <laughs>